Okay, so uh, Zara, Nihar, and Shuman, please, um, you can unmute yourself. And uh, everyone else, uh, stay unmuted. I'm going to share the PPT now. All right, we are good to start. So uh, just to reintroduce everyone, we have uh, in the panel Nihar, Zara, and Dr. Anshman. And Dr. Anshman is having the expertise in data, data science and um, research on artificial intelligence. Uh, please feel free to um, correct me uh, where needed. And what may the Sony Research Center, uh, Dr. Zara, Zara Zamani is also from Metabyte. She's heading the uh, disruptive technology from Metabyte Sweden and uh, blockchain architect as well. Uh, Nihar, he's from London and working in investment, several investment banks in the last 15, 16 years uh, and uh, has expertise and uh, enthusiasm for technologies such as uh, blockchain or underlying uh, technology behind cryptocurrencies. Um, while he has his full-time roles in um, innovation banking domain. And uh, finally, me. Um, my name is Nitish Singh. Um, I'm working with um, JP Morgan as Vice President and Head of Transformation. And uh, my, my interest is also in the innovation banking and uh, doing my research in private equity. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the topic for the day, cryptocurrency. The, expected, uh, the uh, topic is to... Cryptocurrency is brought here to discuss what will be the future, what is the current challenges of the different cryptocurrencies, what are they, how they are uh, made, why it is started altogether, um, and what kind of nu nuances that we are facing. So, of course, when the cryptocurrency is dis discussed, we just talk about blockchain and several other related technologies, and that's why we have um, different specialists and experienced professionals from uh, related fields and blockchain. <laughs> and in the next topic, we'll talk about the agenda, what we are going to cover. But um, I will uh, request everyone to introduce uh, if I need anything. Start. Yeah, you, you can start. Uh, are are we starting with the introduction? I, I, because I understood that you are asking us to introduce ourselves, right? Yeah, you, you can uh, add anything if I missed. Uh, otherwise, we can start with the history. But uh, yeah, Dr. Anshan, okay, Zara, you, go you can ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I, I misunderstood. Go ahead. Yeah. No problem. Uh, perfect. So uh, with, with regard to the agenda, we'll endeavor to cover the evolution and the history uh, of the uh, behind the cryptocurrency, how the currency evolved and how we landed up landed to the virtual currencies like Bitcoin and various others. What are the technology behind cryptocurrency? At a very uh, high level, we'll, try, we'll, we'll talk about what um, helps cryptocurrencies formation, the mining, etc. We often hear these terms. Uh, what are the technology which is supporting the cryptocurrencies? Um, plus, what are the benefit and drawback of this? Uh, we, we also hear various warning from the regulators and the government authorities behind this. What make them warn people? What make them cautious about this? And what is the de demand in future for cryptocurrency? And how it is minted? What are uh, what is the security features? And ultimately, uh, where it leads to now? So we'll try. Uh, we'll be talking about all these matters uh, as, as we start the discussion. So next to the panel. Other members. So, Nidish, just before we proceed, I'd like to say, I think you introduced me saying I'm from London. So I just want to clarify, I'm from India, but I'm based in London. Yeah. And uh, but uh, but again, you know, I, I share the the friendship with um, uh, Nidish, and um, you know, it it is great to be part of this. Um, I'm nowhere as um, you know. Uh, as well qualified as three of our other panelists on this topic or otherwise, but um, but I'm very thankful to be a uh, part of this panel and um, and uh, share my little sort of uh, knowledge that I have. But I'm more interested to to hear what other, others have to say on this topic. I think Nihar, that, that is totally valid. I'm a, we are a, we are global citizens today, right? I've worked in twelve countries. I'm a Persian originally, but now in Sweden. So, uh, I think uh, today we can't really say where we are from anymore, right? We're talking about decentralization. We're not go yeah. gonna centralize our nationalities. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yes. World is a small place. Yeah. And and recently, I think even Dr. Anshuman moved to India, right? 
so sometimes it is very really hard to uh, tell anything accurately about the person nowadays because if i say he is from india yes originally from india but now right now working in london and so on and forth so it's very hard to define anybody nowadays uh, so yeah mm, great so in fact i think that can be a very good starting point if you kindly allow me you know i yeah. was thinking about it and since this is a topic of cryptocurrency but uh, the broader thing is currency or money right and we talked about i think it came you know not by plan but uh, you know it surprisingly came about something called nationality or nation right and as you mentioned i was also in singapore now i moved to india and you know before we start this thing i think one thing i want to mention is uh, three things right nation right indian persian sweden whatever money right and religion right these three are probably three of the biggest forces driving the world right money drives economy nation drives all politics and all of that and religion drives a lot of people across the world right and i'm sure most of you have followed probably the books by Yuval Noah Harari and he talks very nicely that all these three three things are kind of belief systems right we as humans need to simplify a lot of thing and we need to believe in something and he argues that all these three things are not reality right but these are real to us because of our beliefs and a lot of humans across the world billions of people believe in this you know be it money the note that i have it has value because other people also values it and same for religion you know a lot of people believe okay this is the god and this is our god and we have someone from persia and we had you know concepts for el elohim etc there then we had christianity islam etc you know and a lot of people believe in one god others believe in another god and same for nation right whether you call it india or you are calling it london or uk you know and yeah. in singapore we were in singapore and i was in singapore earlier i think 50 years back there was no singapore right there was malaysian part of it and then it mm. became singapore and now singapore is a big country so i think all these three things are probably a belief system and we believe in it and hence it works and i think that i just wanted to share you know my thoughts on that and definitely you know over to other panelists to uh, start the discussion thank you and i would like to add something if if the panelists allow me is nidesh varnesh this side and uh, i just want to add what sure. anjuman said that it, it's above all is humanity which helps in uh, you know building and leverage relationships be it be any part of the nook and cranny of the world thank you absolutely absolutely uh, thanks for your thought so moving ahead with this uh, little bit about the history of the cryptocurrency or even the currency altogether so we all know it started with the barter system some uh, um almost uh, 3 4000 years ago in fact the first coin and the currency was minted uh, around 300 bc 350 bc in fact and the requirement for that was that we need to have a currency system or exchange system which is durable which can la- last longer rather than a piece of a goat or some pound of salt it has to be transferable as well so that people can exchange efficiently and finally it has to be divisible because if someone is exchanging in terms of a goat or any big animal um, for some is, is small um, stuff it, it it might not be always divisible in the required units like we cannot uh, really make uh, uh, cut into pieces any animal if you want to exchange something for cents or pence so that divisibility was required when um, the barter system was still there but the world economy was still growing at that point of time some 3000 4000 years ago so all these actually forced mankind human kind actually to move from barter system to the coin or um, monetary system and the intrinsic value it has to come uh, uh, from scarcity because if anybody can print it and circulate it as they wish it will not be scarce and it will lo- lose the value it will not even be as much recognized 
And final fungibility means it has to be transferable. Like uh, there should be kind of a different values and each value should add um, to a bigger one. So fungibility was also expected as the world economy became more complex. From there, we move on to coin, uh, paper currency, plastic currency, and digital currency. Whereas cryptocurrencies are not just a digital currency, it is a virtual currency. It is not something that is in the bank accounts and can be just transferred digitally. It is much beyond that and much uh, bigger than that. So that, that has been a short history of the currency. And now as we are moving to virtual currencies, cryptocurrency uh, is a virtual one and Bitcoin is just part of the one of the gold standard of the cryptocurrency, if we can say so, uh, because that's what that's something came first in 2009. And after that, we saw Litecoin, um, Ethereum, etc. coming to the market gradually uh, every two, three years later on. And currently, I, I believe we have around 2600 different cryptocurrencies. And it is still, I think somebody would be launching new ones as we talk. So this is the evolution of the cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies, and um, someone called Satoshi. He has been, or she has been the uh, alleged source behind this. People are still looking for the person. We can't find out. If someone can, please bring him to this, to this panel maybe. But there is a lot of suspense. Maybe some thriller movie needs to be uh, also made. So Satoshi, is considered to have launched this. And uh, people say that um, he still holds almost a million Bitcoin. Almost when Bitcoin is at around $50,000 per coin, um, who knows who, who is this Satoshi and how much he has still. So that is the uh, little bit of history behind the virtual currency. So I will leave now I the some, next piece. Yeah, Zara. History, history. yeah. Uh, so I uh, I think well I'm not a historian but as far as I know and my my knowledge says that uh, cryptocurrencies didn't really start with with Satoshi right so and I think you're muted Zara you might have to no. unmute yourself oh my God sorry yeah. <laughs> I've been talking sorry so, so it didn't start with Satoshi and then we we did couldn't hear yeah sorry. So uh, yeah, so Satoshi was not uh, Satoshi, of course, um, invented Bitcoin, but was not the only the first brilliant people who talked who talked about cryptocurrency and had the idea of decentralization, etc. Right. So mm -hmm. in 1983, we had David uh, Chow who who talked about eCash, the concept of eCash, and having cryptography uh, intertwined with the money system. And when we talk about Cryptography for those of us here in the room who are um, probably not very familiar with all this terminology is, is a way of um, storing and also transmitting data uh, in a way that uh, those who only this, this data or this money is intended for can have access to it or can read it. So, uh, so yeah. the idea of cryptography came with eCash in 1983 with David Chong. And then Later, I think about 12 years later, you had the idea of DigiCash. And DigiCash then talked about, again, cryptography, cryptography for the sake of making transactions more confidential. So now there was a purpose introduced for cryptography in, in this money system. And then later in 1998, the idea of decentralization came with the uh, way die. Dai started talking about decentralization of this uh, money system, financial system, et cetera, plus the cryptography. And all of this together were made, th these are the very important history. So it wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto being super smart or, or they like maybe they are a group of people, maybe they're an institution, we don't know, right? Yeah. Them being super smart and coming up with the idea of a decentralized distribution, uh, uh, you know, uh, currency, etc. So I just wanted to highlight there is a history behind a Bitcoin being invented by, by Nak Satoshi as well. And Sat why, why did Satoshi Hello? came up? Sorry, 
great uh, financial uh, crisis, the economic crisis in 2008 that was the drive for, you know, uh, behind uh, such currency being in need in financial system globally. So yeah, that's just uh, something I wanted to add in history before we go and dig in more. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Zara. I think uh, just while we're on the topic of Satoshi, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, someone, uh, you know, some of our audience um, might find this interesting, but I think that the word goes, um, according to one of the researchers, and, and again, I'd like to quote him, his name is Varun, and he apparently he has tracked Satoshi's Twitter account. Now, obviously, this is all this is all hearsay, but if anyone's interested, the Twitter account goes by the name uh, Gold Lover. Yeah. Um, now, you know, how true it is or, or, or not. Uh, but again, I'd just like to... It's Indian then, right? <laughs> well, it's hard because to say. I think... Of gold in India. <laughs> no, no, you're dead right. I mean, we, we do love our gold in India. But I think uh, one thing about, they say about Satoshi and the way the white paper is written, it's, it, it could be, as you say, it, it's not one person. It could be a group of people, but it's very English. Uh, it sounds like someone from the UK, the style in which the white paper is written. Now, how true it is, um, it, it's hard to say, but I just thought our audience might find that, uh, that piece of uh, information um, Interesting. If they want to follow that Twitter handle and see the, the tweets that came out, uh, and it's kind of similar in the initial sort of emails that um, uh, that came out from Satoshi Nakamoto. All right, excellent. So now we have we have almost established that it is not uh, digital money. It is more than that. And the history really started back in 1993 as eCash, um, uh, which, which as Ajara exp uh, explained. So yeah, uh, because who knows how and when the thought initially discussed and we all only know the end product often and we miss the uh, other unsung heroes behind any such products. So. One thing which is the source of criticism and maybe even the strength of cryptocurrency is that it is not tied to any valuable asset such as gold or silver even. Though at some point of time, uh, and it is already even as much valuable as the gold. So it is not linked to any particular commodity as such as gold. And uh, hence, there is a criticism that there are risks. If the price is rising, uh, there might not be enough worth basically to recover the value if any speculation or any uh, volatility causes the crash, and it does happen, it, uh, not, not only just in last one or two days uh, or last two, one, uh, one or two weeks after Elon Musk uh, tweets, it has happened in the past as well. Back in July 2019, um, when I checked the records, it crashed up to 5% in just 40 minutes span. So it, it does crash often with a big number. Uh, one of the reason the critics say that it because it is not tied to any particular value or tangible asset, that's why there is less amount of reliability on this. So what do you all feel? Any, any other thought? Nidish, as a Bitcoin investor and a, a Ethereum investor, I can tell you it's, it's been a, a pretty rough ride in the last week. Um, but yes, it is highly volatile, but that's the nature of this new um, sort of uh, uh, cryptocurrency, the product itself. Maybe the drop, maybe the other panelists can uh, can share, you know, can, can maybe add some more color to this. But maybe the, the heavy drop is due to the fact that Elon Musk said, you know, that it, it may be priced too high. Maybe the drop is due to the fact that the bond, you know, um, the interest rate in the U.S., uh, uh, on the bonds has gone up as well, but uh, but it is highly volatile. That is for sure. I definitely agree with with it being highly volatile. But I think it generally, as a as a general public, it's good to look at how not don't don't look at cryptocurrencies. How is the world of business model evolving today? So we are really moving from. Um, 
um, have building businesses around the, um, you know, tangible or, or like physical assets to now coming up with innovative business models driven by data, right? We're talking about data economy. And when we're talking about this currency not being backed by gold, by silver, by what these are again, we're talking about past. But now, on the other hand, I think, in my opinion, the future, in future, we have no currency. We are selling and buying data. That's it, right? So the currency of future is data from my point of view. Yeah. And in thinking like that, in fact, this currency, it is backed by data. And that is the most valuable thing today. We're not talking about gold anymore. We're not talking about silver anymore. We're not talking about oil anymore. So we are talking about the most valuable asset of today and future, data. And, and of course, it's not that we, okay, now it's backed by a, a silos of data. No, it's backed by upon request available traceable data. And, and that, is, that is what makes it valuable here. So, uh, and the, of course, now we are, we are talking about a quite immature still technology like blockchain, right? And those of us who are now here in this room, 36 people, we are among early adopters. There is a still an early majority that will come after us once we have fixed the problems. So, and it is very, very common to have all these, um, you know, scalability issues, volatility issues, all these challenges until you, you really balance and settle out a, a technology. What, on the other hand, I would say blockchain technology is uh, already settled in some specific areas. But we're, when we're talking about financial systems, I would say um, I, I, I don't always nowadays at least agree that it is not backed. So I try to defend that it is basically backed but it is not backed with what we are used to see up to today. So what would you say it's backed by, uh, Zara? The data. I, I would say... The yeah, data. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's backed by, uh, upon request, available traceable data. Right. And that is exactly what our financial systems today is not backed by. Because it's a right. centralized system. We, we don't have access to this data. And uh, to be honest... Uh, how many of the countries today, how many of the central banks, today, how many of the money systems today are like really backed up by gold for, the all, for, for all the money that is out there in public in people's hand? Not, not many of them, right? So yeah. we are, our money system today is partially backed by gold, partially backed by reputation of where, where, where did these governments make this reputation from? So we have no other choice to trust a money that is backed by a government reputation, whether we agree to it or whether we don't. So you're saying that the, 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 gold, the, the gold behind this is the system it works on, which is blockchain, which is unbreakable. Yeah, and, yeah, and also public ne network, the network. The network. So now, yeah, because we call it a trustless network, right? Because right. we don't need to trust the central uh, house of control. Your trust is, is distributed. All of us, it's backed up by every single node. It's backed up by all of us. So, and if we don't trust it, that means we don't trust ourselves. Right. Yeah, it, it is uh, Yeah, very valid argument in the, um, yeah. in the context of today's uh, criticism that, okay, no tangible product is linked to this. But on the same time, um, in 1980s, when the, when the US dollar was dealing to uh, gold, and then the hypothesis was that gold is now backed up by the confidence in the U.S. economy, right? Um, so, so to speak, if the U.S. economy or any such system can give the confidence to U.S. dollar, then why not the currency, which is of the people, by the people, and for the people, maybe that can also have enjoy the same level of confidence, and then we don't need to rely on gold itself. And that, that also brings to another two points that I had for the uh, to, to support why the virtual currencies are needed because traditionally the currency have been facing two major issues. One is for the regulations. If a currency is regulated by one particular government and um, sometime because of the geopolitics that, that is not liked by one particular country, then people try to even uh, threaten the existence of that currency as well. Be because one central bank has to 
regulate, create that particular currency. In case of Bitcoin or virtual currency, we don't have that problem. No central body has to manage, mint and regulate that currency. It is by the rule and off the rule, right? And um, secondly, the fr fraudulent creation. So we know even Indian currency have been falling prey to this. Uh, time to time, people start printing it. They get the paper, they get the ink, and it, it started to print. So those things are not really a problem for uh, virtual currencies. And we'll talk about in more details the technicalities that why it is so difficult and how it cannot be fraudulently manufactured. But these two problems are in uh, actually in favor of uh, cryptocurrency because it mitigates those issues and uh, addresses those issues as well. I would like to add probably to the discussion. So there are two main things we're talking about. One is volatility and other is underlying asset backing some currency, right? Now on the point of volatility, it's not about the value that you're talking about. You're talking about the price and price and value are two different things, right? There is an underlying value for something and there is a price for it and market decides the price based on the demand, supply and a lot of other factors and market can be irrational also, right? As you're saying, it has dropped, you know, by so many percent, but if you see in few months, it has probably tripled, gone up by 200%, 300%. That is because of, you know, probably this webinar and media hype that, you know, more people getting interested, increasing the demand, and hence the price will go up if the supply is limited in this case. If there is a more demand, the price will go up. And if there is a risk or somebody tweeting that, hey, it is not so good, it can fall. And it is not just about, I think, Bitcoin, the same thing happens for the stock market. Uh, Tesla stock has rallied like everything, increased 700%. And nobody knows if you're in a tech bubble. And uh, you know, all tech company stocks can crash tomorrow. I think we have seen 2000, you know, uh, it went through the roof and you know, it crashed like anything. So I think the price can be fluctuating. It depends on the market. It depends on irrationality. It depends on the fear, greed of human beings who are operating in the market. And especially for Bitcoin, as you have pointed out, till now a small set of people have adopted, right? The sample set is small. When a lot, the sample size increases, the error or those fluctuations probably diminish. But if there is a small set of people and a lot of new people coming to the market, I think volatility is something which will probably be there. Second point that you are mentioning about underlying value, right? And you know, we are probably assuming the discussion that gold has underlying value, right? That that is probably I could sense from the discussion that we are assuming that gold has underlying value. Mm -hmm. But even gold doesn't have any underlying value, it has value because we value to them, you know, we think gold is valuable, India and other gold. And if humans said, okay, gold doesn't have value, it will be like, you know, stone and it, it don't have any value, right? right? And uh, the discussion that you had earlier about, you know, first there was a gold coin and you said gold is rare, so it has value. Done. But when they started doing that, you know, it started during the Greeks and then Roman Empire, right? And after a point, they realized gold is limited. That actually created a problem because when the empire expanded, they could not create enough currency to back the empire. Because Roman empire started in, you know, went to Persia and a lot of other places. And when it expanded, they needed more currency to support the empire. And they did not have enough currency. And there are problems in the empire. They had to print more money. What they did, they actually broke down those coins, melted them, started adding impurities to them, right? They started mm -hmm. adding copper and other things to the coins. And what happened over a period of time, those were died or, you know, almost ended, the currency or even the gold coins that they had, you know, they had almost no value, right? Mm -hmm. And that has happened for most major currencies in the world. If you go back to, you talked about 2000, 4000 years, you're talking about dollar now. But there were currencies even before that. You know, Roman Empire had currencies, even other empires had currencies. You know, there were German currencies during World War I. And when those empires ended, all those currencies lost values. You know, there were inflations and most of the currencies ended. We now have, you know, dollar and dollar is considered gold standard. A big reason may not be underlying value of the dollar, but it may be, you know, uh, the World War I and World War II and US still is a global superpower and people believe 
that you know it is very powerful and they can back the dollar but if you check the value of the dollar also in absolute real value the dollar value in last 100 year has diminished by 96% right so if you said dollar is not also volatile that will be wrong it's extremely volatile value has crashed like anything and i think now they are printing 2 trillion dollar to support the pandemic you know and the inflation most likely i'll predict will rise and the value of dollar will diminish further right and as you pointed out also in 70s and 80s when they removed the bretton woods system you know even dollar or any major global currency is not linked to any underlying asset now all the money that we have with us you know it's just the government and the bankers and i think we have two eminent bankers here so they are giving the confidence and it's about the trust it is not about the underlying asset for any global currency that we have now yeah 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 that's uh, totally agreed uh, anshuman that's um, um, that's such a good point so i think the the two things um w- would it be fair to say then the two two things the way i look at the cryptocurrency is the store of value and then the peer to peer transaction um uh, thing so it's not just so it it's not just the fact that you can the peer to peer transaction over time that will be made easier and the acceptability but also the store of value that makes it valuable is is that fair to say uh, back to the panelist yeah i, I definitely agree with that yeah so i would probably summarize by saying that you know if people trust it and people believe that it has value and if it happens that more and more people believe it then probably the value will keep increasing Incre- but yeah. if there is a risk and there is you know even comments by bankers right at some point i think jp morgan and many big banks opposed cryptocurrency right hmm. and now many banks and financial institutions are supporting it you know and they are you know having tie up a uh, very recently i saw that even india's biggest bank sbi has a tie up with jp morgan to adopt cryptocurrency and blockchain right So if there are bigger yeah. institution, government, if they support it, you know, then I think it will grow. But yes, if you know, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, or Singapore government, US government comes back and you know makes a statement that okay, we are not going to use it, probably it will not be a very good for a currency like you know Bitcoin. So I, I would uh, yeah, I, I definitely see the point. Like. Um, be it gold silver or even uh, platinum it is all about how we perceive whatever we value it will get the value ultimately otherwise on its own it has no, uh, no value and if we give the same support to bit bitcoin or virtual currency it will also appreciate and will become the uh, currency of the people now uh, a, couple, a couple of days back uh, i and nihar was discussing actually that uh, the canadian government is in the process of recognizing this formally they launched the bit uh, the bitcoin etf on the exchange uh, the short name is btcc and uh, now it is in us etf market and if these things are happening the governments will start to formally recognize this so i think that movement has already started initially people were not liking this but now uh, as we say that first people will hate and then will laugh at you and then will accept that's that's what is happening for bitcoin as well not just the people is for the currency as well so it's just a matter of time maybe when all other governments will start to accept in india there are two uh, kind of school of thought as well at on one hand uh, banks have started to kind of see the points in bitcoin but on the same time government is still resistant to accept this formally as a currency uh, and the obvious reason is that uh, if all such currency are started to be recognized which is launched by any maybe technocrats or the bankers themselves then what will be the role of the central banks what will be the role of the ba- the government to manage control and the print money so that kind of a loss of control is somewhere driving the paranoia and also lack of recognition for such currencies so that I is also understandable to, right yeah to to add to that i uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you nidesh yeah, please uh, i think from my point of view the governments are taking two approaches towards mm-hmm. uh, adopting a cryptocurrency or at least pretending that they are going to adopt it right so some governments are being very proactive um like uh, well united states allowing banks to you know hold a node in public car- um, blockchains and hold coins for their clients and this happened in uh, late 2020 right and that was a big step forward 
or you see mayor of Miami now paying their employees in Bitcoin. So like this oh. is a big step forward as well. But some other governments, like the Swedish government, I'm talking about now the, mm. the country, right? Sweden is one of the most innovative countries in the world. It's always the top country in innovation index, etc. We have a lot of research going to cryptocurrency. But some other governments like Sweden, because we have very tight regulations, on financial systems here, right? And very long, there's no corruption in the first world. That's a diff different story. So, uh, but because of all those restrictions and tight regulations, they come and introduce a concept of CBDC, which is central bank digital currency. And mm -hmm. to, uh, today, I think 83% of central banks around the world are uh, at least researching uh, CBDC, I was reading this recently, 63% of them have started um, developing something or at least uh, studying the concept of having their own CBDC and 13% are already in proof of concept. They already have CBDCs out. And CBDC in, in Sweden, Sweden was the first country who came out with its own CBDC, central bank digital currency, and that is called e-corona. And then again, that is just a pretend because it's going to be another centralized digital currency. So, and I absolutely think that is a false way going for governments because governments want to be in this um, um, movement. They want to be part of it. They want to show that we are not lagging behind, but the whole yeah. idea of adding cryptocurrencies to decentralize your power and now you're introducing another centralized digital currency what is the point so there are two different approaches right to towards the digital currency and cryptocurrency from my point of view, i always have them different right digital currency for me is centralized cryptocurrency for me is decentralized so I think it's very important to recognize the movement if it's going to happen from governments towards cryptocurrency, even if they want to have um, to introduce a coin that has to be a decentralized coin. CBDC in long term is not going to work on, unless eventually they move to, uh, to decentralized platforms. Otherwise, there is no uh, way of wasting. Yeah. So, so Zara, is it is it is it fair to say, Zara? Though, so they are effectively just moving their fiat currency to a digital exactly. currency, but it's not really a DeFi system at all. It is still Definitely. a central system. Yeah, yeah, Definitely. yeah. Definitely, and to so be that's honest, a that's not very. Yeah. That's a pretend. And to be honest, that's not a big deal for a country like Sweden no. because we already Absolutely. don't have cash in the system. We are Correct. already very digitalized in in payment systems and the financial systems. Right. So it is not much of an effort. It's just a pretend from my Yeah, system. yeah. So as long as it's DeFi, right? It's not you're not you're not giving power to the people. So you still have to trust the middle system, the centralized system system and as long as that happens it is just a pretend currency as you say it's just another form of digital currency that is fiat currency right Definitely. and when we're talking about decentralization we are talking about decentralization and transparency in financial systems because we want to be able Sarah, to your voice is very low um we, we are barely able to hear yeah okay. Niha, can you hear uh no no i can uh zara's voice is very low yeah, zara yeah. your volume might be yeah We're not able to hear you now. Yeah, we're not able to hear you. And uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 100%. Now I cannot hear you, so let oh. me just... Okay, is it okay now? Yeah, we can still hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry. So um, when you're talking about decentralization, right, in, in finance systems, we're talking because we want that because we want to see, to have transparency. We want to see what is going on. 
I don't want to have an account in a bank and only know what is happening to my money. I want to see what 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 the ba- what the bank is doing with all this money that the bank is holding. What and the insurances that I have in terms of bankruptcy of the bank, maybe it never covers the money that I'm keeping in the bank. So there is, I need to know what the whole bank as a whole is doing, and also. Um, you know, when we're talking about corruption in financial systems, like I said, I always insist that the corruption is not only that only exists in developing countries. I have worked in 12 countries, right? I have worked in um, third world countries, developing countries, and first world countries. And corruption is everywhere, is everywhere. It's just different in shape. So when we're talking about Sweden being the most, um, you know, transparent system. We had the biggest corruption of decade last year with Swedbank, Bank, but in the branch of Poland. Why? Because again, the system is centralized. Why should why should we as the public not see how Swedbank Bank is handling the money of public? You know. So, and w- if you're going to introduce another centralized digital currency, you're just going to to digital this, and you're just going to make it easier for you to influence your own power. That's it, because you have now the whole center of data that you can manipulate. So what I want is as a public user is not to to have a system that no one is able to manipulate it. No government, no mafias, no drug dealers, no one can can manipulate this. So, and it's transparent to everyone. Well, of course, transparency doesn't mean that we are going to breach privacy. There is a too big uh, different there's difference here, but yeah, I just wanted to add that government's approach towards um, cryptocurrency uh, have to be really closely watched. A lot of times, governments come saying that oh no, we are leading ahead, etc. But we, and now we are introducing our own currency, our own digital currency, and majority of public don't really know the difference between digital right. currency and cryptocurrency. So that's a very good point. I'd just like to Absolutely. add a little bit to that. Uh, so I think there are two points here. So when you're talking about Bitcoin, right, there are multiple aspects to it. As you mentioned, one part is cryptocurrency and underlying there is a blockchain technology. So that's the technology part. And there is other part to it, which is it is decentralized ledger and nobody's controlling it. And I think they, these two parts have very different implications. What I would think logically is that people or even government or banks won't have problem with blockchain, won't have problem with cryptocurrency, because these are technologies, detailation, which can help governments also, banks also. But where the big problem will be is in the centralization versus decentralization, because that's like a shift of power. For example, I think the same thing happened when internet came and social media came. Everybody wants to use social media. So, you know, when US election is going on, even Donald Trump and everybody was using it in a big way, and he probably helped politicians win elections, right? But at the same time, when social media bans a Trump or other big politician, then I think worldwide politicians are not liking it. They want to regulate social media because they see social media has more power than a politician or a government, right? So I think government and banks will be okay with the technology, but they won't like that power going from government and financial sector to the hands of the people. And this, this kind of conflict will you know, keep going on. And I would predict, if I'm allowed to predict, is probably, as Zara mentioned, many central banks as well as governments will adopt the technologies, right? But they will launch their currency. So they may not want a Bitcoin. They may say, okay, US, you know, crypto coin or something like that so that they get the benefit of the cryptocurrency and the blockchain technology, but they still you know, control the currency and they hold the power. And same goes for the banks. And maybe at some point, again, somebody will come up with another technology and try to disrupt. But I think this power struggle will keep going on and that is the biggest factor, not the underlying technology is what I would probably um, think. Yeah, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to add to that. So. Yes, I think that's a that's a really good point. So, so the banks can adapt uh, adopt the, act, the technology itself, because right now in the banking system, the amount of errors that happens on the transactions and everything, and the cost of transactions that happens is quite huge, and and so you have the cost, 
and then you have the errors. When compared to blockchain technology, and um, the time of transaction, and, and the time, and the time that it takes, so which also adds to the cost. When compared to the blockchain technology, it's much more efficient, and it's going to become more and more efficient as it as we go on. And in terms of the error, it is you know, it is, if there is any, it's 0 0.00001. So it's almost non-existent. Um, so, so that, that's, that, that I'm, I'm pretty certain that the, the technology is definitely going to be accepted um, by, you know, by, I would say everywhere, even to store data or by banks or everywhere. Now, when it comes to the actual currency, and this is just some of the, the articles I've read, yes, governments might come up with their own um, decentralized or centralized uh, currency. Obviously, as Zara said, centralized, that's just, uh, that's, you know, that's like uh, pretending because long as centralized, you know, what's the point? But even if countries come up with their own currency, I think like to the, in today's world, if you look at US dollar as a fiat currency, it is the universal currency. And one of the problems that other countries have, to name a few, you know, China or Russia, they hate the fact that US dollar is the is the global universal currency, because all of a sudden, their assets is now dependent on the fact that, you know, US dollar can go up and down and US dollar can be printed at any time. Uh, US wants to print that money, right? So, so uh, some of the interesting articles also say that one of these big, so there will be, um, uh, a, a cryptocurrency for each country, but there might be something like blockchain that will become the US dollar cryptocurrency of the world. So in other words, there will be one currency, cryptocurrency accepted by the whole world, but then there'll be specific cryptocurrencies by each country. But again, this is something that, you know, I thought I'll share because it, it sounded quite, you know, an interesting sort of uh, theory, if you like. Yeah, definitely. I would like to add something to that, but maybe after we cover what blockchain is for everyone, so we can, so they find a better understanding of what we are talking about. Yeah. So actually, we have a couple of uh, good questions uh, also coming up, and uh, we have uh, a few great um, uh, topics. So uh, as we just discussed about the exchange, low cost and efficiency. So let's take a scenario. If two people want to exchange bitcoins and want to make the payment, how it works? So. Uh, uh, and, and, and correct me uh, if you want to add, add anything. So basically, if one person you want think to transfer five dollar worth of BTC, so there is kind of a very cryptic uh, address of BTC, right? Uh, based on some uh, blockchain technology, I'm just sharing one of the example here. So address will be given, and uh, maybe Alex or uh, wants to send to Stephen, or maybe Nihar, you can send me some bitcoins. So there will be address given and there will be very minimal charges of some in decimal points of the charge. And it will also depend on how fast you want. If you want to, within 10 minutes, the charges could be even larger. And regardless of the amount, the charge will be quite consistent, almost constant for a given level of time if you want to transfer. So the, the code will be given, the address will be given, there will be minimal charge and it can be transferred based on an app. So I can download an app on my phone and in, uh, that will be in the Nihar phone. We both have the, uh, the that address for the Bitcoin and we can exchange the money across the world without having any central bank or any bank in uh, as an intermediary. Now, in this process, of course, there are some uh, other geopolitical risk involved, but this is how it works and this is how it is so efficient. Next how it works, what is the uh, technology behind this? So Alex is actually, uh, suppose the person who uh, wants to send it, Alex is actually, uh, who is claiming to be, so there will be some, I think, uh, online identification done when setting up the app and there will be nodes. So the technology, how it works is that Alex will be basically sending the money through the nodes and nodes is the different points in the blockchain basically. And uh, Alex will use his private key to send $5 to Stephen. Maybe Nihar is sending $5 to me through uh, using one of the nodes and his private key. His private key is very sensitive and confidential that he should not be disclosing. Uh, and then there will be a one public address. So one public address that he has will be known, but the private key will not be known. And once it starts to travel from one node to another node, then 
blockchain nodes and the system will know nihar's private key but people will not be knowing it and that's how the different nodes in the blockchain will confirm whether he is a valid person to send that money or not a and that will also confirm how much money he has in his wallet he cannot send if 5 dollar if he has only 4 dollar in his wallet so that will be confirmed and um, right. debit and credit will be confirmed uh, amount which is being transacted will be confirmed and this is how the private key will be verified and uh, so long as 51% people in the entire chain and the nodes confirm that okay nihars um is a valid person valid i am um, uh, holding valid identity on the blockchain mm -hmm. nodes uh, that will be passed on that will be approved to be transferred to steven or from nihar to nidhish uh, if 51% people validate this so this will be kind of a, a message which will going through all the nodes and will be kind of popping up and activated then 51% people 51% people across the chain will confirm and this how the transaction will be uh, completed so that that is a high level uh, mechanism to explain how the transaction is done uh, maybe um, to yeah. some of you if you can add something does this make sense or anything you want to add yeah so your private key is like your pin on your atm card yeah you know so without the private key so you have the public key that's on the public domain and right. then once you have the private key uh, and as you say the nodes uh, so as long as you keep your private key safe you know your your in your you know your your wallet is safe effectively right. so if, if that is lost yeah. or hacked then you are in trouble all the blockchain will be gone oh, sorry all the bitcoin or virtual currency will be lost and also you need to safeguard the wallet your right. wallet also can be transferred and we have many yeah. cases of people losing that right we have cases of people losing their uh, private key that they have uh, hmm. uh, a lot of um, yeah uh, bitcoin that they have bought long time ago and they have lost their key so that is definitely something you need to keep in control i think you might have read one of the uh, one of the incidents in the uk to go and search all the bins where they have all the the disposal of all the rubbish because when he was cleaning his house he also dumped all the all the hardware which had all the private keys and now it's worth some crazy amount of millions so um so these these kind of things has happened but nobody at this kind of uh, price either i guess so yeah. if anyone can you know explain i'm just curious to know like if you lose the key you know, what happens and is there a, also a possibility of someone hacking and getting getting your key because uh, as i understand it's just a key maybe some alpha numeric or some character right mm -hmm. uh, so a hacker can probably try to generate a lot of different keys and try to, you know hack into the account and do something so what happens if you lose a key and what happens if someone trying to hack into the account and get your key i think that kind so of i think in terms of security i'm not a cyber security uh, expert but in terms of security so the blockchain itself is very secure because you have you know and, and that is because of you know all these um hash every block is storing the hash of the previous block so you want if you want to let's say hack block number 100 you have to hack the whole uh, chain be, 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 be before that so and that i think it's not impossible but it's just it requires a lot of computational power that is extremely expensive and time consuming that it doesn't worth it for someone to do that but um but in terms of being hacked being your account being hacked because how do we buy crypto and how do we trade crypto today is through exchanges right and then again we have centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges so for example coinbase is one of the very famous and number ones right which is a centralized exchange so your account there can be hacked and once your account there is hacked they have access to your wallet right they they can do whatever they want they can just uh, you know transmit your bitcoin to their own account and once it is sent to their wallet you cannot really do anything with that so you, the, the the incidents of hacking your accounts in with exchanges has happened 
not once or twice, quite a number of times, but the chain itself the, has not been hacked so far. So I understand the blockchain is very solid and you know, a lot of people have to confirm for it to happen. My concern was more about the individual account because in case of a bank account, so if I have a JPM yeah. account, in case something you know untoward happens, I can still still complain to the bank or lodge and okay. case, you know, police or government can do something. But in this yeah. case, we don't even know that you know who did it and it's just probably an account somewhere in the world we don't even know. Uh, Anshuman, I, I, what, Anshuman, what I would say to that is, I think Zara touched on it. I think you can have a, you can have a private wallet, yeah, um, and say that can be hacked. Your personal computer can be hacked, right? And your, your, like, like you know, with any other information like your emails, similarly, they can also hack into this. So I think what people do is a couple of things, either when you have if you if it's your private wallet that you bought from the bitcoin um, uh, dot org you can have it on your computer that private key or generally what people do like uh, you know the mass amount of people they buy it from something called coinbase so it's not it's not your own private wallet your wallet is held on coinbase mm -hmm. okay so so on coinbase you can have it on your phone for example, so and that you'll have face recognition and pin on your Coinbase. So say if somebody, if you lose your phone, they would still have to put in the pin to get into your Coinbase account, for example. And that's and that's where the wallet is held, where your Bitcoin or Ethereum is held. Um, now, of course, if you buy Bitcoin directly and hold it on your laptop, which is not totally protected, then it's like any other uh, sort of information that you have on your computer. If, if anyone can get into your computer, they will also get into your uh, private keys. Yeah. The easiest way to buy uh, uh, any of these cryptocurrencies uh, is you, Coinbase or Revolut or there's many, um, you know, that, that would be my advice. Yeah. And we have decentralized exchanges as well that, um, you know, you can try. And also we have concepts of hot wallet and cold wallet, you know, right. hot wallet, cold wallet not being connected to internet. Hot wallet is the wallet that is connected to, to internet. So there is a lot of um, prevention methods that you can take as a trader to, to um, prevent uh, someone hacking your account. Um, but... Uh, whether it makes it impossible, absolutely no. There are, of course, there are still ways to be to, for your account to be hacked. But when you're talking about uh, the security of the chain, the chain is very secure. That means you cannot manipulate with the information, with the exchanges happened, with the transactions happened, etc. But you can still there are uh, chances to to hack your account. So as much as it is, it is possible to hack my uh, internet password for the bank account, it is also possible to know that, basically. Because the oh, cold it, wallet it, can protect yeah. it to a great extent, but not impossible exactly. to hack it. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. And, but one thing we need to make sure is that people, when we're talking about uh, security of cryptocurrencies, people tend to forget what is happening in the world today. Your accounts with bank today are much more volatile and fragile to be hacked than your accounts with exchanges. I mean, but we tend to forget that. We, we tend to believe that we are in a very secure system. And now we're talking about a very, very strange system. But uh, we are more... Um, uh, we, have, we are in more risk of being hacked today with our centralized banking system. And then, like I said, again, I uh, always give example of Sweden. I don't go far away because that is the country I can give example. I cannot judge other countries, right? We have, for example, Folksam is one of the biggest insurance companies in Sweden. One million and two hundred thousand users data was accidentally lost. So, um, so that is the same thing with the banking system. You can be accidentally hacked or um, even with our tax office. Last month, we had 200,000 users data lost and that, that, that they were hacked basically. So th there is a still a lot more uh, volatility in centralized systems than when we're talking about exchanges with cryptocurrencies, to be honest. Got it. There are a couple of, Questions. 
sorry, um, uh, Ashwin, please proceed. Now, uh, but uh, ju just to add, there are some questions on the legitimacy of all the transactions and uh, in uh, global trade that can also stem from this. So we can talk about that as well subsequently. Yeah, we have quite a number of. I just saw the the um, uh, chat. Okay, we can get back to them maybe. Oh, we are. We have. Um, we don't have much time for Q and A left. <laughs> we have exceeded yeah, yeah. the time. So some of the Q and A we have, um, have already covered, and that relates to the accept acceptability of the virtual and uh, currency cryptocurrencies in different world. Uh, we have touched upon that, that governments are in general avoiding this. And uh, on the same time, they are saying that they are fine with people holding this, but they don't, uh, they still are warning. So US and Canada has part, partly started to uh, support this, but they are still uh, warning people not to hold it. When it comes to the valuation, basically, uh, I'll touch upon that uh, briefly. And Nihar, you may also add. In terms of the valuation, it is considered like a, for those who are in banking industry, it is considered as level two investment, level two category of the valuation. Means the value of Bitcoin is cannot be directly taken from the exchange because it's not always in a public exchange like a, uh, uh, like a Mumbai Stock Exchange or New York Stock Exchange or Putzi, etc. So it is considered like a level two because we can take the input data from various sources like a website, and then we can use the models to arrive at the value of the Bitcoin investment. So that's the level two investment in terms of the evaluation. When it comes to uh, like uh, whether it is legal or illegal, um, it is banned for transactions. So in many countries, it is still illegal, but uh, in India, people can still hold it, but it cannot be used uh, like a normal currency. People can just hold it in as an asset. In many other countries like US and uh, Canada, it is exchange traded fund, part of the exchange traded funds. So <laughs> it's partly legal now. So th this is how it is evolving in different countries in a different form. We have discussed about the security already. Uh, mm. In terms of evolving um, adopt, adoption evolving in different countries, I think there are um, multiple factors that we need to keep in mind. Uh, it's um, user experience, it's the regulations. And when we're talking about regulations in a country, we're talking about, it's very important for governments to keep regul because Regulation is there to protect users, but also support innovation, right? So it's very important for governments to keep that balance that you, you don't shut down the innovation, you support innovation, but you also protect users, you also protect consumers, the public, right? Citizens. So um, I think adoption of cryptocurrencies in different countries uh, we will definitely see it happening more. And um, in developed countries, uh, it will um, it will be more challenging with regulations because there is a very robust, tight regulations there. In developing countries, um, there is a challenge with centralization of power, the power loss that is going to happen, but also, but there is a opportunity in developing countries because a lot of the developing countries haven't modernized their payment system. And this is a, this is a right. leap job. You know, right. now by adopting this, you are not only modernizing, you are going way ahead of the developed countries. So Correct. you will see, you will see different approaches in developing countries from my point of view. Some, some are very like, um, um, forward and pro adoption. And of course, uh, the more centralized the power, it will be more difficult. But even uh, talking about that, I come from, um, from Iran myself, right? I was born in Iran. And then so I always look back on adoption of these technologies in a country like mm -hmm. Iran, very centralized power. And, you know, uh, with all these political um, challenges, what you see, what you saw was like two, two months ago, probably you have, you have read it in the news, we had China 
opening the biggest mining farm in Iran because electricity is extremely cheap there now, right? And then um, whether cryptocurrencies are now helping the Iranian government to bypass the sanctions or not. So it's very interesting to see how governments are approaching adoption of um, uh, cryptocurrencies to fight against centralized politics as well. Because now the world's uh, politics is also centralized to countries like United States or in European Union, etc. So they make decision for some other countries in the world. And, uh, and so it's very interesting to see how this technology is going to, uh, to create a whole different type of war in the world. And it will, we will see it in, in happening. But, but from my point of view, United States is going to uh, basically move really fast in terms of the adoption because now the institutions in the United States are investing. We have Tesla investing 1.5 billion. We have Amazon talking that they are coming. We have Apple talking that they are gonna, gonna invest. So we have all these huge in institutions. And once institutions invest, public trust and public invest more as well, right? Because now yeah. we're not talking about all, all these crypto geeks only adopting or only buying Bitcoin. We're talking about companies now buying Bitcoin. But right. from my own point of view, again, why United States institutions and corporations are investing? Because as much as we're talking about Bitcoin being decentralized, absolutely. But we still have to keep in mind that 98% of uh, Bit um, Bitcoin wealth is owned by 2% of nodes and more than half of these 2% of nodes are in China and that yeah. means we, we kind of have a centralized decentralized system back to China and now the United States is investing more and more to decentralize that you know because they want to have more share to decentralize the power of Bitcoin from China to other countries so uh, even if if governments are going to adopt it a lot of it is for that you know to make sure that they have the power still so there's power intentions behind the adoption as well it's not only about the good that is going to give back to public definitely so so that the entire virtual currency hinges on two aspects one is technology uh, maybe blockchain and uh, cryptography and the second is the geopolitics and the power struggle basically definitely. right and these two i have seen also they are like making most of the impact on this in fact, too, um, uh, one of the questions is that acceptability across the world. And it's very hard to summarize all these in, in a few minutes. But I have almost 600 plus page report, which summarizes the acceptability of the legal acceptability of this currency in different uh, countries. Maybe uh, for, a, for a different discussion, separate discussion, we'll have more. But right now, it is very great. Different countries have different views. Some have and a different degree of acceptability acceptability is there as well. India is not at the extreme end of blocking it, but also it is not as open uh, as compared to United States and Canada, etc. So th that is the um, uh, view of Indian government and uh, government across the world. One valid argument also I see against the virtual currency probably, um, and you, you can tell me whether it is really valid. How about the safety and security, like uh, in terms of the uh, uh, global geopolitical crimes as well? Like suppose that two um, ill-intentioned people want to exchange money amongst themselves across the world. And since uh, we are not able to, and be, because it is shared on the public domain, like a distributed ledger, which is blockchain, we cannot validate the identity of the person. It's like a you know your customer or anti-money laundering perspective that cannot be enforced in the blockchain kind of technology. So how we can ensure that one ill-intentioned person do not transfer millions of dollars to another one internationally to commit something illegal. And that is one of the very serious argument against this. How can uh, we uh, mitigate this? If I may, I literally Please. add a couple of points because I, I always get so excited when we talk about cryptocurrency. But, the, but just to add a couple of names is BNY, Uber, MasterCard, all these companies are starting to accept. So it's just a matter of time. And uh, uh, and and yes, China is the biggest miner of you know Bitcoin, and US obviously wants a bigger piece of it. Um, uh, uh, so and then on 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 Nadish's point. Sorry, remind me, Nadish, what was it you you just uh, said? How to how to mitigate the chances of right? Uh, no, no, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah because I lost my I had lost my train of thought. But but the reality is, and I'm sure our other panelists will more to add on this. So I'll say very quickly: 
but cash in itself, you know, it's not like just because it's Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, it, it, there's going to be illegitimate use of it. Um, you know, cash has been sort of used for uh, illegitimately or illegally for generations, right? And it's almost impossible to track cash, right? Absolutely. But, uh, right? So, but anyone Thank who understands, <laughs> right, exactly. But, but when it comes to blockchain, it is traceable. Right. So it yeah. is a lot, you know, so it is a lot more. So I hear a lot of people say, oh, we cannot accept this because it promotes crime. But that is the, you know, in fact, cash promotes more crime than cryptocurrency and especially the technology that backs it. But I'm sure Sarah and Anshuman will have more to say on that. Um, yeah. I, I will let, let Ansh, do you want to add something? Because if I start talking on this, Anshuman, I'm going to talk like <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I let you do it first. Dr. Anshuman, any, any thought uh, of how we can, uh, w how technologically it can be prevented? So I think a uh, very good points has been shared already. And as Niha rightly pointed out, you know, uh, cash can also be used and is being used probably for a lot of such things. But at the same time, I'd also add probably it's not that even the banking system, you know, there was a comment also on the chat, right? And in mm -hmm. fact, there are big banks which have been also found, you know, complicit in some of the largest scandals or corruption or probably, you know, yeah. they are just trans Absolutely. And in fact, this is my intuitive understanding. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you people are the more experts of the banking system. I think some of the biggest banks, right? Like, um, you know, the biggest role probably they, they play is to transfer a lot of money from one end of, end of the world to another end. You know, and many of that money, you know, may not be 100% white or, you know, very uh, legal kind of money. So I don't say cash or banking system uh, can't do it. In case of blockchain, as Niha pointed out, it is traceable. But at the same time, I would say the risk with not just blockchain, but any kind of such digital transaction is also, it is traceable to an account, right? Uh, whereas even in case of cash, you can go and find, you know, somebody who is holding the cash and you can do something. Yes, it may be difficult, but possible. And even for banking transaction, after five, 10 years, you can trace and find a person at the end of day. Whereas in the digital world, a lot of things are accounts, right? And, uh, and since I work more in the side of data science or, you know, those areas, a lot of these accounts or those things can be created by robots or programs. And it is not possible to trace them. For example, you're talking about hashing here. The same hashing can be used for creation of account so that nobody can trace who created that account and who it belongs to, the physical person, right? Even the IP and everything can be blocked so that outside world can't see, right? In fact, we use those technologies on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think the risk probably is higher here, I would say. Because even if you can trace all the transaction, yes, you can trace all the transaction, you can trace all the accounts, but tracking it back to a person, physical entity, might be more difficult in case of blockchain or any such digital uh, currencies. That's a very, very valid point. But when people ask me this question, like, oh, now uh, drug dealers can easily, you know, um, change their black money and, you know, exchange it and they start using it globally, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I, I usually, um, first of all, this is, this is what, I, what I would say. First of all, is it not happening today? Is with, with central systems? It's definitely happening. Do you know how many banks in Colombia are actually owned by drug dealers? Do, do, do you know, or in Mexico, do you know how Central Bank of Iran is operating in terms of, all, you know, all supporting all these uh, uh, terrorism groups, etc.? We don't know. Is, are they really doing something? We don't know. Are they not doing? We don't know. So is it happening today? Yes, it is happening. Is it traceable? No, it is not traceable. And the other thing is, is blockchain going to do a miracle to clean data off the bad people? No, <laughs> there is a different misunderstanding. There is a misunderstanding here. Blockchain is not the prophet sent by God to clean the world of, you know, money launderers or drug dealers or, you know, terrorism or anything. No, it's just providing more transparency. It's just supporting people public to fight against it in a more 
um, more technology based oriented and more is just a support. That's it. So whether they're going to work on this platform, definitely they, they are smart. They're not stupid people. If they, if they can do it today, they can definitely do it with blockchain as well. But the only difference here is now we can trace it. We can see, we can, see, and it's not, and the other thing is that the validation of these transactions is no more in hand of one entity awesome. yeah. so today if if a, the drug dealer in colombia wants to send all that bunch of money to europe the validation of that is in hand of one bank is one branch in europe and one bank branch in colombia so and if they are together they, are, they they have this connection you know the business relationship then this transaction will happen but when it's happening on blockchain we have a whole network that needs to validate this that they cannot really buy the whole network and say that you're now all part of this drug dealing uh, business, right? So the, 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 it's just going to prevent it. It's just going to make it more difficult, but it's not going to clean the world of all drug dealers or all uh, money launderers, definitely. So it's just more efficient, cost effective, and uh, fast, but it's not, it cannot do the job of the policing, and it, the, that job has to be done by the respective authority. To, to a big extent, it will minimize it. To a big extent, it will minimize it. But, um, but it's not going to make it zero. You know, even today, you go to a hospital, you, you do a blood, you do an HIV test, the result comes out as saying 99.9999, you don't have HIV. But it never says 100%, right? Or, so it's or the, the probability. Yeah, exactly. So it's the same thing with blockchain technology. And in general, you can never be absolute, right? I'm also researching in, in uh, blockchain adoption in small and medium enterprises in Hamza University. So in, um, and I'm a pragmatic researcher. So there is no absolute to anything, right? We're just yeah. providing a technology that is supporting against money laundry, is supporting against corruption. So, uh, but uh, but uh, these people are actually, and I, to be honest, these are all mafias, right? To be honest, if you look at the, and I think there are multiple books on this as well. The oh. biggest mafias of our today's world are governments. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that yeah, is so, true, yeah. And, and blockchain is fighting against that. The yeah, majority the of the governments part. are involved in all, all sorts of these black monies, you know, and, and, that that's why blockchain technology is being questioned a lot by governments because they are part of these mafias. So, in in, in true essence, basically, uh, the, blo the the cryptocurrency democratizes the banking system because otherwise Definitely. the banking system yeah. is in the hand of the governor or the head of some central authority, and you as the people can't do anything. But in this case, as it is a distributed ledger platform and everyone is part of that, I'm going to approve your transaction and vice versa. It is democratizing that entire banking and financial system. And that's why the government is challenged and as such, they don't want to lose that grip. Uh, with that, one question I often get, and I'm also wondering on that, we, we talk about minting, right? Um, uh, or uh, mining these uh, coins. So uh, what I understand is that there are certain codes and the algorithmic challenge and the puzzles and the people work on that. And once the block is added and people decode those uh, puzzles and the um, kind of the codes, they earn a block or the Bitcoin, right? And this is how it gets created. Uh, and since yeah. that, that requires a very super fast and high, highly efficient computing power, maybe and multiple different attempts to decode that, Basically, this is the kind of a way to earn that Bitcoin and there's a limit like a 21, 22 million up to which it can go. And I have a chart here which also says how many has been already minted for different mm -hmm. currencies here. You can see for Bitcoin, there's a graph here, all the price, movement, everything and circulating supply is 18.64 million already minted. And it has right. almost 21, 22 million uh, threshold. So my question is with this one. Suppose I'm trying to do permutation combination in order to get that one Bitcoin. I want to mine this. Um, and right now it depends on my computing and puzzle solving skill and my computer power. Another thing which is coming up is um, uh, quantum computing, right? Qu quantum computing is said to have maybe a thousand times more computing power and the speed. Within a second, it can kind of uh, uh, outperform all the 
computer system in a particular country, right? So my question is that when someone gets hold on the quantum computing in the future and they use that to do the mining for cryptocurrency, uh, they will outperform almost everyone. Of course, by then, most of the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, etc. could have been minted right. or mined. But uh, still, uh, there is a potential yeah. that those kind of uh, supercomputers, like quantum computers, cannot yeah. only do mining better, but also they can be used to hack my password because uh, faster and more efficient the computer system, the better uh, job it can do. So, what is your take? Just very quickly, I I can just add a little bit, uh, Nidish, to that, right? Mm. So, so yes, yeah, supercomputers, quantum computers. Uh, will still be mm -hmm. worthwhile even if there's no bitcoins left. I think the I think by 2140 they're supposed to be all the bitcoins are supposed to be mined, right? But that's not the only in uh, revenue stream for these miners, right? They will also by by getting these ASIC computers, which are application specific integrated sort of systems, these super computers, even you know, they'll still continue the mining because the transaction fee will be worth it for them, which will be paid in terms of Bitcoin. So even if all the Bitcoins are mined, it will still be worthwhile. So as long as the price of Bitcoin is high, it is always going to be worthwhile. And if anything, these quantum computers, I'm going to make the transaction processing much more efficient because that's what we want, right? We want a bigger volume of transactions to be uh, processed quicker. Uh, well, that's my understanding anyway. But those super super fast computers, cannot, can that not be used to do the mining faster so that will be like a power to mine will be restricted to few hands. That's one of the concern uh, that only few people who have access to the quantum computing will be able to mine it better. And not to forget, the uh, uh, right now we have almost 2600 different cryptocurrencies and is still being added. So it will continue to be added in the future. There will be more and more cryptocurrencies launched and some people will be mining, but those who have the access to quantum computer will be able to mine it better and faster. A, B, that will also uh, be used to hack the that private key that we talked about earlier um, at a more efficient rate or in a more uh, effective way. So those are another technological concerns behind the cryptocurrencies. So uh, uh, what, what I would add here is, first of all, um, proof of work is a consensus that is used in um, some of the cryptocurrencies, not all of the cryptocurrencies, right? Yeah. And, and proof of work is the only uh, consensus that concerns mining, right? And uh, of course, Bitcoin is one of them. Uh, if quantum computing is coming to the picture for mining, then uh, and the mining works in a way that the more bitcoins are mined, the difficulty of these equations are going higher and higher yeah. as well, right? So it's both ways. If if someone has access to quantum compu computing for mining, then def def definitely the difficulty of these equations with the aid of quantum computing will go higher and higher as well. So it's re relative to each other. It's like it's not that one will really increase in quality and one will stay as the technology it is today right. and you know, wait wait for it to. So it, it, it will be both ways. It's not a one way highway per se, but, uh, um, but it will happen. Yes, it will happen, but we also have to look at other cryptocurrencies that are using different uh, consensus like proof of the stake, for example, Ethereum, uh, is uh, well, I don't think it's gonna happen soon. At least I think it will need oh, two years or so for, for proof of stake to be able to to be publicly used. But we have um, Cardano. We have Cardano that is one of uh, the most yeah. stable proof of stake cryptocurrencies, right? Yeah. Which doesn't really concern um, mining or computing or all these. Uh, um, and yeah, Ada is is a. I think I will. I think Cardano is a really good um, platform. And and now they're launching their smart contract as well. So you will see Cardano That's being good. used more and more in coming future. From my point of view, yeah. but. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to add. So it's not only um, about mining. It's, we have proof of authority now. We have delegated proof of stake. We have so many different uh, consensus algorithms that are being used in different, um, different cryptocurrencies. But of course, the most used one, Bitcoin and Ethereum, today are using proof of work. So and they're concerned with mining. And that's why there's a lot of talk about sustainability issues, etc. So... Um, 
that, that that's the only thing I wanted to add. But also about sustainability, um, um, a lot of power today being used to mine is also green power. But that doesn't make that doesn't justify it. But just it's it's a better situation compared to a um, few years ago. Zara, you mentioned smart contract. For the benefit of our audience, uh, could you briefly tell us what a smart contract is? Well, a smart contract is basically a code. It's uh, making your paper contract uh, digitally and based on pre-authorization and automation. So you you make you make a physical if a physical contract between two entities or two person was going to take like. Uh, you know, back and forth sending documentation and send, checking your licenses, et cetera, and then signing it. Now it's going to happen in a matter of um, a real time, in a matter of milliseconds, and everything is done digitally, all the validations, and then you have pre-authorized nodes that they can actually execute this uh, code basically now. So, and, and uh, that was the start of my own uh, uh, journey with blockchain, to be honest. So I started working with blockchain in 2015 with getting to know what the smart contract is in fintech and travel tech. Um, and uh, Ethereum was the first uh, platform that uh, was providing a smart contract. So Bitcoin is only a cryptocurrency. You cannot build applications on top of Bitcoin. And we have, when we talk about Bitcoin, we have two Bitcoins. We have one Bitcoin with capital B, which is the cryptocurrency. Yeah. And what Bitcoin with a small b, which is the blockchain platform of it. But Bitcoin uh, in general is, um, um, is a um, cryptocurrency. So you can, crypto is a um, currency platform. You cannot build applications on top of it. But Ethereum was the blockchain that came out saying that actually enabling users to build applications to use, you know, this decentralization. When we talk about healthcare application of blockchain, energy distribution or supply chain, so th and they are all empowered by a smart contract, uh, at least majority of them, which was introduced to the world with Ethereum. But then eventually uh, Ethereum was talking about the cost of mining that is very expensive, you know, using all this uh, electricity power. I was reading like uh, at some point, um, um, mining one Bitcoin would cost like one week of electricity of the country of Poland. So like, is that expensive sometimes to mine, uh, to mine Bitcoins? So they were, uh, they started talking about proof of stake, which is a different consensus in validation. And they launched uh, their um, proof of stake in December 2020. So hopefully, hope, uh, hopefully it will come to public use soon. Uh, but uh, the smart contract is basically the tool that allows you to build applications. Oh, on the option, the right. Understood. Thank you, Zara. Appreciate that. So this guy didn't get you your passport? Sorry? Is someone asking a question? Um, all right, I think um, there's one on you. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, this is a very valid question and important one is smart, a smart contract. So um, uh, Zara, just to con confirm, and uh, maybe uh, Anshuman, you can also um, add some point that the smart contract and the Ethereum is interlinked in the way that Ethereum is not the Bitcoin as such, not like the Bitcoin as such. It is a different type of the uh, tool. Uh, whereby it is a decentralized application platform as such. It's not the uh, app itself. It is a platform of decentralized applications. And uh, my understanding is that focus on the smart contract. So a smart contract is kind of a coded contract, just like I give you an agreement to sign off. And I say that if you complete this contract, I will pay you $1 million. It is just like a coded contract. So in that, what happens is that um, I send a code, coded contract to Nihar. And uh, Nihar, if you um, sing a song, I will pay you one million dollar and uh, the contract will be such that once he sings a song it will record and will automatically transact one million dollar to can, him can i sing then... with him as well if he's gonna get rewarded <laughs> for one million <laughs> i can do the dancing backstage you know <laughs> uh, yeah so we can code that one so we can just change the name from nihar to someone else or maybe uh, zara and uh, anshman can be part of uh, some uh, such contract so it is uh, coded in the legal nomenclature 
and it is programmable code uh, which is called a smart contract and ethereum is a decentralized platform of all such application which deals with the smart contract and that in that sense ethereum is different because uh, many times you will think that okay all of these uh, cryptocurrencies are the same yes uh, litecoin and bitcoin are quite similar and same uh, Bitcoin was the gold standard, Litecoin was uh, the spin-off of that, it's like a silver standard, and then Ethereum is kind of a application platform, kind of, you know, just like a blockchain. It, Ethereum is oil. more linked to oil, they say. Um, <laughs> that's what I heard Winkle was Brothers, who is the initial investors into Bitcoin. Um, uh, you know, when I was listening to him, they say Ethereum is, uh, is the same as backed by uh, uh oil for example and as you say bitcoin is gold standard and uh, litcoin is probably silver but that's what i heard but um, but yeah. yeah over to you guys so the example of that is a, a will pay to b if um, if b performs um, some uh, some task and automatically the smart contract will pay from a to b automatically as soon as b completes the task and no one will be involved into that. It will be all automated because it is programmed accordingly based on certain checks and controls. So that is the smart contract and that's Ethereum. So of course, then Ethereum is also being used for various other cryptocurrencies to launch on their platform. And that's how they also derive its value. Um, and that is significant difference between Ethereum and rest of the cryptocurrencies and smart contract, of course. Any, anything else? Uh, uh, Ethereum has for so long wanted to launch proof of stake for for their uh, Ether, the cryptocurrency, mm. right? Yeah. And um, while on the other hand, Cardano ha have has started with proof of stake for ADA, and um, has it's the most stable proof of stake blockchain today. And now, if Cardano is g going to have their cryptocurrencies, uh, their uh, smart contract this year. <laughs> then Cardano can really be the blockchain that is being adopted um, by uh, mass more than Ethereum even, by, by, at least by institutions. You know, because we have public blockchains, we have private blockchains. And a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, criticism against using private blockchains, which I'm not really criticizing mm -hmm. that. I'm, I'm actually a fan of them for some use cases. But, um, but then Cardano is going to be the, the blockchain that allows institutions now building on public blockchain and having their own coin and trade them on public exchanges. Excellent. So, okay, so is it fair to say, um, so quick question, so is it fair to say they're all using blockchain, right? Yeah, it's, they are all blockchain. They are all right. different, different blockchain platforms. So when we are talking about blockchain, uh, is we have the, the, the only different the, the only different types of blockchains that we have is public blockchains or private blockchains yeah. and public blockchain means a blockchain that anyone at any time anywhere can wake up in the morning say that i want to be part of this network without having to go uh, through a kyc or anything so i can wake up in the morning say okay i want to be part of uh, um, Bitcoin network. So, and then I will be a node. I can perform there, uh, being be part of or be part of Ethereum. So, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're all public blockchains. But Ethereum is a chain that provides a smart contract as well. Some chains don't provide a smart. But then private blockchains are, uh, which or sometimes they call it enterprise solutions, are the um, blockchains that they use all these uh, smart con these usability, these advantages, these use cases within an organization an organization say that it will say that i want to use the transfers they want to use the fast transactions cheaper transactions and you know having this decentralized manner but within my own organization only for my own employees for my own team only i don't want someone to wake up in the morning and say i want to be part of google for example a blockchain or or um, volvo blockchain for example so then they will come up with these private blockchains for their own enterprise only. There is also hybrid chains, you know, a combination. And the, I, I have experience building all three, private blockchains, public blockchains, and a hybrid blockchain. So that's why I, I am not one of those blockchain uh, experts or architects who are against private blockchains and say, mm. oh, they are not uh, really uh, sticking to the core value of decentralization because it's all about, you know, 
finding a use case for technology. And that technology has to be flexible enough for anyone, for any use case to use it. If an enterprise wants to use the decentralization and faster transaction and, and using crowd wisdom in te, in, within their own uh, organization, why not? It is just a blockchain for God's sake. Just because it's not public doesn't make it less mm. blockchain. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, Anshuman. Yeah, no, that's yeah, great. Thank you, point. Zara. I think we are running out of time. I just will make a quick comment and then a very quick question for the expert panelists. So my comment is that, you know, we started with the, you know, concept of decentralization and, you know, everybody having the power is for the people, by the people. But one of the key points at the end we highlighted is to mine the coin, you need kind of very powerful computer. And in today itself, I was reading, you know, NVIDIA, which produces some of the biggest GPUs, hmm. you know, which cost $5,000, $10,000 dollars to buy one GPU. So their 10%, 20% revenue is coming from only the Ethereum and other, you know, miners. So basically, at least even now, you know, quantum computing may come, but even now to mint a Bitcoin, you need a very powerful computer, right? You need a GPU which you have to pay $10,000 US dollar to get one GPU, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, Absolutely. I assume hardly 1% or 0.1% of the population can afford to get that. So even if you're saying, you know, for the people and it's very democratic, you know, I don't think even if they start mining on this, no, but, you know, you, you, you don't, of course, you, definitely, I understand your point. It's, it's your point. It's not very democratic. I can't wake up in the morning and say that, oh, I want to be, be a miner. I can be a part of a network still. I can still see the transactions. I can see still what is happening. But I can't wake up in the morning and say, I want to be a miner if I don't have all not those anymore. computational power. Not, not anymore. anymore. Exactly. At some point, I remember like three, four years ago, like everyone in, my, in our neighborhood at least was right. looking for computers to be to be a miner in bitcoin uh, but not today definitely no right. so you'll need i think now a lot of computing so i don't think you know it's probably feasible for someone with a small computer they'll, no, no. they'll take five ten years to mint one small coin <laughs> so that's correct on the for the people and like on a very practical note i have a question that you know i follow the prices of course i'm not expert of bitcoin i, I would think yes blockchain will be there and as zara said it can has a lot of other application, including smart contract, private, um, you know, Bitcoin, etc. But coming to you know, the investment, which I know a lot of people may be also interested in. So last year, the price of Bitcoin was 5,000 USD. Uh, now it is close to 50,000 USD, you know. Uh, yeah. So it has gone up 10x and we're having this session now. So I have a personal question, which others may also have. We have some of the experts on the panel. So like two, two sub part to it. One is, is it a good investment now at 50,000 USD Bitcoin? And second, is it also good to, you know, start minting? So, you know, Bitcoin now. So what do you think? What are your thoughts? Answer, my answer to that, to both of the question is uh, triple yes. Just like we have triple A for the rating. Here I would say triple Y. Because yeah, the, the value is expected to rise exponentially as it is getting the momentum. Uh, if not now, maybe in a, in a year or two. Uh, some analysts and even speculators say that it can, it can go up to $1 million, right? So yeah, value it ha can touch the sky. And mining is definitely, yeah, very, very valuable as the price is going up. Even if somebody can mine two or three Bitcoin and give, uh, there's a chance to become the millionaire just, just on the foot of the Bitcoin. Great. Thank you so uh, much. I'm not a crypto trader. That's a strange, right? I, I hold crypto today, but I'm not a trader. So I, I, because I find myself not that smart to be able to trade and, you know, protect the market because I'm, I'm a builder. So I build blockchain applications. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but to answer your question, I, I don't want to give financial advice. So this is not a financial advice. This is just a personal thought. Is uh, yes, it it does uh, worth investing today as well because it, by the end of this year, I I, I was reading some predictions. They are predict it's predicted to end uh, 2021 with the prime Bitcoin is predicted to end the year with the price of minimum 300,000 US dollars. So, um, so there is a room for investment definitely. Um, yeah, and not only Bitcoin. I mean. Um, 
ether or or like uh, look at other uh, other for example yeah, Arnado, we have a couple of on the Litecoin, street exactly uh, or or um, ada from of cardano once they launch their smart contract platform the price is not going to stay as you see today so it's it's just good to you know uh, one one tip is in general how i look at it is i look I go to their platform, their, their website, and read their white paper and see the upcoming uh, plan of the company. So what are they doing and how big is their, commu their, their uh, community and, you know, how they're developing. So if, if things are going uh, positive, then the, it's a good uh, coin to invest in. It's definitely, I would definitely suggest to read white papers before you invest in. So. Just very quickly, I think I'm I'm going to say the same thing. I think where both of them said, I would definitely say, Anshuman, it's uh, right now it's 45k. Of course, as Zara said, you know, there's no personal financial uh, financial advice, but very personal opinion would be definitely it's always a good time because I look at it as two uh, value streams for these things. One is peer to be a payment transfer. So even if it doesn't catch on like crazy. Right. The, if you can also look at it as store of value, like we look at gold. OK, so even if it doesn't catch on like how it's supposed to be that, you know, you go to Africa or some countries and when where you can use peer to peer transfer where the banking system might not be established. Right. Even if that does not happen instantly you can still look at it as store of value. So either way, my personal opinion, you, you should jump on it. But obviously read the white paper, as Zara said, um, but I would always say yes to the popular coins for sure. Ethereum uh, and uh, Bitcoin and obviously Litecoin as well. And Cornado. What? Cordano. Buying the coin will be better or minting the coin will be better? Excuse me? So buying the coin is better and minting it is better. So I you mean mining? You mean mining? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I mean, listen, uh, you are never going to mine a coin with your computer at home. Okay. So if you want to start mining. Okay. He'll get one. Reason I said we have, you know, AWS infrastructure where I can select multiple NVIDIA GPU and we have cluster mm -hmm. of super. Absolutely. So where yeah. I mean, our, you know, why, if, why if, mining? If, yeah, if you can get the infrastructure on Shuman to, to set up a mining center, then of course the, the, the value, if, if I'm saying the value of Bitcoin is going up, obviously the mining business is getting more and more profitable. So if you, if you can have set up the infrastructure <laughs> where you can set up, uh, uh, you know, all these supercomputers, then of business, because as the value keeps going up, you're going to make more money as a miner as well. Because going back not that long ago, where, you know, the whole Bitcoin transaction system crashed because there was too many transactions. And as you pointed out, the, the value of Bitcoin dropped to 5,000. A lot of these Chinese mining companies had to shut down shops, right? Because it, was, it wasn't profitable enough for all these yeah. mining companies to, to make money out of it. But of course, as the value keeps going up, um, mining business is also going to be profitable. So if you can afford to do that, amazing. But even as an investor, absolutely get in. It is kind of the same question, you know, and uh, uh, with, with, with all respect, basically it is the same kind of situation when we can do buy the fish or we can do the fishing. It's always, I prefer to know do, uh, uh, fishing yeah. because you never know how many such opportunities will come in the future. And if you can uh, do the mining, learn the mining and gain the efficiency into that, then sky is the limit. So it's always better to uh, uh, know how to do the fishing rather than buying. Anybody can buy. No, no, 100% uh, Anshuman. And for me, I think I'm also looking up how to learn blockchain, for example. I mean, Zara is obviously, you know, has been into this five years. But, um, you know, uh, apart from being a, a little investor into blockchain, uh, I'm also trying to look up courses for blockchain because I know for sure this is a skill set that is going to be uh, so in demand in the future because it's going to be everywhere. So I would say anything related to this is a big yes as far as so whether it's mining, whether it's investing, whether it's learning the technology. I would say a big yes to all of this because this is going to be everywhere in the future. Thank you. I always, I always uh, bring this point. Is there an industry that doesn't benefit from transparency, decentralization, and speed and the cheaper transaction? 
Do you know an industry that doesn't benefit from this? At least today, we don't know any, right? And right. therefore, there's no industry that doesn't have a use case for blockchain. And blockchain is really not anywhere close to even early adoption. It okay. hasn't happened happening yes. more and more and it, that's why you will see that's why they call it internet of value and they say that it will revolutionize our life the way internet did yes. and so and now only people are starting to understand and trust a little and companies are starting to think about it but it will definitely be a skill as, as Nihar said that is in um, extreme need in future including the governance, governance, education sector, and uh, everyone are exploring to uh, know how to in implement blockchain into that and uh, 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 kind of keeping some confidentiality. Uh, uh, previously, many in, in bank and it, still now, they are exploring how to bring the blockchain, the custody, sec lending, all, all these kind of um, uh, businesses which requires the transparency, speed, and accuracy, all three. So uh, it's a massive and big technology. It's just a matter of time when everyone learns and implement this. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would uh, uh, make one announcement as well that uh, we constantly get the um, questions that, okay, we um, time to time launch different courses when we are going to launch a cryptocurrency because no one is doing that currently and not having a full understanding of how the technology and the financial services uh, overlaps and how they intersect their path. So uh, to that, um, when people see this video later on, my uh, answer is that in, in future, we are in the process of making a plan, uh, a structure and uh, preparing the syllabus for launching a short as well as a little bit uh, long-term courses in the cryptocurrency. And uh, as soon as it is ready, we'll make the announcement. But uh, until then, um, excuse us uh, for some more time. And uh, uh, even after this video, you can continue to post the questions and we'll try to respond, uh, be it YouTube, LinkedIn and all. But uh, yeah, stop not the learning process just after this video and webinar. Definitely. Right. So anything Definitely. else that you all, yeah, you all want to add some golden points before we finish for the day? I will just um, uh, say that I, I will just ask people to get educated. That's that's all because a lot of problems that we have today is the lack of awareness. First of all, uh, by public, by business leaders. Th that's why I started all these you know chain talk, the talk show, and also I on Clubhouse I have these weekly rooms that I. Just, it's blockchain for business leaders because a lot of approach is technical education. While we actually need business perspective kind of education for people to understand the concept of the technology and what they can do with it in their business. And once the business leaders decide that now, okay, this is a good technology for me to invest in, then of course you can bring in the technical people to build it for you. So, but, but it's very important to educate yourself to be aware if, if you're not in the um, world of investment in, in cryptos, you don't need to jump in right now after this call and buy Bitcoin. No, learn, read, yeah. understand it yourself first. And then also, you know, understand what is technology, what is the blockchain technology? If you're a business leader, try to map your own business challenges, whether blockchain can actually be a good use case. There are checklists uh, out there that uh, you can check. I also built my own checklist for, for organizations that you can l look through it. I haven't published it anywhere, but you feel free to reach out to me. We can have a discussion. But uh, yeah, get get educated. The most important thing is to learn what is happening. And if you're in this room today, you're one of the lucky ones because not most of the people are really aware of what is happening, to be honest. Right. Yeah, if I'm if I may just uh, add to that, I I would uh, um, I would say the the same thing just to give a little bit of perspective from my side. I also own a little uh, small restaurant in in London, and I'm also thinking of how to start accepting bitcoins, for example, from our customers. So so all I would say is, of course, my day job is working in the in the financial uh, you know banking sector, um, but you know and I'm sure we all share, I'm thinking of how to implement sort of the, the acceptance of Bitcoin. So as, as Sarah said, I would say 
you know, get educated in blockchain uh, and get, you know, either, you know, I, I sometimes when I want to order takeaway or go out to eat food, for example, I say to myself, let's not spend the money today and let's invest in Bitcoin or let's invest in <laughs> Ethereum. Oh, so, so it's so, not only me doing that. <laughs> no, exactly right. You That's know what good. I mean? So, yeah, and this is it. That's because I know this is going to be the future. So every little investment you're going to make into blockchain by way of education, by way of investment, or uh, setting up uh, mining shops in any way, shape, or form, get involved, and you will be sure to um, benefit from that in the future. That would be my advice. We are the proverbial birds who are flocking together here. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Birds of the same feather. Yeah, uh, we all have a penchant for blockchain and cryptocurrency, and we are um, looking forward to invest heavily ourselves as well. So, uh, let, let, let's see. I, I, I actually, uh, m my eight years old daughter has invested her weekly uh, pocket money in Bitcoin. And every day she asks me to show her how, how the money has increased or decreased. So she gets very disappointed a few days ago when, when it, there was a drop. But still, I mean, even now, now, because she sees me like thinking and investing and buying and talking to family members, etc. because I have forced all my family members to invest in Bitcoin. And I have made, I have told everyone, I'm not going to buy you New Year, a Christmas gift or New Year's gift or birthday. I'm just going to buy you Bitcoin. I'm just going to send Bitcoin to your wallet. That's it. You're giving me ideas. You're giving me ideas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anshuman, how about you? So no comments. I learned a lot from all of you. Thanks to Nirish for inviting and to the you know panelists' great insights. So final question. I have final very brief and pointed question. So what are the best sources to learn and where can I buy any website? Uh, it's very important for you not to trust any exchange. First of all, and also even uh, like well, I I um, use Binance and uh, Coinbase. So and uh, the, yeah, so these two are the exchanges that I use: Binance and Coinbase. And um, even with them, you have to very much be really uh, careful with the. Uh, URL that you're being, because there's a lot of problems there, you know, like, you know, hackers building exactly the same and you, you automatically, you know, with autofill, try to go to the URL that you always have on your computer, but make sure that you're not really providing your username and password to fake URLs. But, um, but there are def uh, decentralized um, um, exchanges coming as well that you can go to, but for now I'm using Binance and Coinbase and Coinbase Pro is um, apparently better than Coinbase. I haven't used it yet, but I have I have had this, some uh, issues with Coinbase in terms of you know restricting accounts regularly, and that is probably because of the high demand these days that uh, some of my expert trader friends were suggesting me to use Coinbase Pro instead. So so that is I haven't started using it yet, but I'm going to do it soon. But um, that is where you can go to. And uh, what was the other question? What's well, learning. Uh, learning. 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 <laughs> Everywhere. I mean, YouTube. Uh, I mean, every on Coinbase itself, there is um, like every coin that comes out and if they're listed on their exchange, you can really learn about them. They provide some material that you can read and you can watch videos and etc. But um, you, you can learn from everywhere these days. I mean, YouTube, Udemy. Uh, um, is it reliable? Like, so there are a lot of videos on YouTube. There are so many websites, but will they be reliable? They'll give the right info. That's, I mean, that's once, I you, once you really start learning, you find you find it out yourself, whether this is a source, this is right or wrong, because there's a lot of forums, there's a lot of discussions. If you check the websites of all these blockchains, they have their own community that you can go on Telegram. They have their own communities that you can join and, you know, just uh, read their discussions on daily basis and learn about from them, etc. So, yeah. And uh, Twitter <laughs> is a very good source of learning.
Yeah, and yeah, to be it, honest, it, follow, follow Elon Musk because it looks Elon like Musk. Elon Musk is the predictor of uh, cryptocurrency price. So usually the, the, whatever he tweets, the, the price will go really high, right? Yeah. And Shuman, and uh, I think uh, same as uh, Zara, I think Coinbase is the most popular. I would go with that. It's the most easier to set it up uh, to start off with. Revolut is also good. And uh, I'll also send you a few links of some of the popular articles, documentaries, etc. I'll be happy to do that. I'll reach out to you after. But generally speaking, there's information everywhere. But I understand, uh, uh, you know, Internet is a big place uh, to go and find information. Uh, so, you know, I, as I say, to start off Coinbase, Revolut, any of those, and I'll send you a few links as well after the mm -hmm. after the webinar. In fact, it's a very valid question. What is especially the one uh, Anshuman when he asked that where to go to buy? Learning is still low risk, but buying something, someone sent me a fake link and say that okay, send uh, the money of one hundred thousand dollar and I'll send a bitcoin. That is much more to be cautious of. And I think this is where we need to kind of have more discussions, maybe uh, develop some kind of knowledge reservoir in the future. Maybe uh, we need to make some forum or the group in the future, whereby we can develop some more authentic information for learning, for uh, buying and uh, kind of knowledge awareness. I think there's a massive need for that because though it is lucrative field, but equally it is open to fraud and risk as well. And this is where kind of a, there's a massive need for people to uh, spread the right information and knowledge as well in, in this. Right. That is very important. And I think continuing such discussion is extremely important because as you said, there is a lot of info, but getting the correct info and getting the right the guidance is very important. I was hearing about this for a long time. I keep reading. That's how I learned whatever, you know, little I know. Uh, but of course, there is a lot more to run. And in fact, in terms of purchase also, I tried to do that last year. And as you suggested, I installed Coinbase, et cetera. So I think when I was in Singapore, I think I could do something, but in India, they don't allow to purchase or do anything. I don't, I think every country, they have different regulations or something. So in India, yeah. I have the Coinbase app, but they don't allow me to do any. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Okay. Understood. Um, so that way you might have to go to bitcoin.org and, yeah. and then buy it directly, but then you need to be careful with where you store that private key. So I, I, I hear your challenge. Yeah. In India, they have not some apps who are claiming that we can buy and sell Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful. And I think it may not be reliable if you're investing exactly. so much of money. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Understood. And this is where more trust, uh, like uh, more education and awareness is needed because if we can become such pieces, then imagine that so many different people can be uh, defrauded as well. Um, so, and there are so many different terms like top coins, token, there are so many different terminologies. Uh, of course, we can't discuss all of this today. Uh, we have hundreds of important terms to talk about D apps and so many different things that maybe uh, we, we can discuss in another session. But yeah, there's a massive need for kind of a, uh, ongoing discussions on such topics. And uh, thank you so much, um, everyone to join. And uh, if there's no other question from the audience, we will um, close the discussion for today. Uh, because we have already uh, went beyond the scheduled time. Uh, thanks to the panelists. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Anshuman, uh, Dr. Zara, and uh, Nihar for participation and making it a huge success uh, indeed. We'll try to do such more initiative and discussions in the future. And uh, in the interest of everyone and in our interest also to uh, know and uh, um, uh, kind of uh, brainstorm on such matters. And of course, uh, to the audience, um, definitely we'll be also working towards launching some uh, educational courses, short term, long term, medium term, etc. in the future uh, to keep you more informed and ready for the future. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was a great discussion. Absolutely. I'm personally enlightened. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank Pleasure you. meeting you all. Yeah, same here. Have a, great. Have a great day. Same to you all. You all too, guys. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.